Good morning and thank you and welcome to our uh, second and final day of the High Tech Spring Leadership Summit sponsored by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Um, I hope that all of you have enjoyed your time here. We have an exciting program uh, lined up for the remainder of the summit, uh, some great sessions. Looking forward to, um, after this breakfast and this event, a fireside chat with corporate vice president and CTO of, uh, of Microsoft, um, as well as uh, some additional exciting fireside chats and, and sessions throughout the day. So thank you for getting up bright and early and joining us for breakfast for this uh, first event for high tech, um, uh, a, a particular breakfast uh, focused on empowering men. Um, the title of this session is uh, Making Progress, Empowering Hispanic Men as Advocates for Equity. And I'm so excited to see so many men in the room today because this is such an important topic, um, certainly um, in our world, in our workplaces, but um, as an organization for high tech. Um, as you know, we have been doing the Women's Forum for many years, sponsored by Accenture. And I got a little bit of a flashback there. I thought we were at yesterday when the announcement came out. Um, but um, that has been, you know, really such an impactful, um, such an impactful forum and space for the women leaders in the high tech community, and also for the men, because as you know, we do two of those a year. One is women only, and the other is uh, women and advocates. And I feel like there has been so much learning, um, so much connection, so much collaboration that has come out of these sessions. Um, and i um, super excited to do something specifically focused around men and how men can be advocates. Um, a year ago when we were in Wells Fargo, um, I uh, came up to the stage and, um, and, and, and maybe this is a, a separate conversation, but I came up to the stage and kind of addressed the issue of men's mental health. Um, and I, I don't wanna miss the opportunity to do so again um, when we have so many men here in the audience. Um, this is, you know, I, I believe just a crisis um, in the United States, and I think all of us um, have been touched in one way or another by um, a friend, a, a, a neighbor, a colleague um, who struggles with mental health um, have been uh, severe and often tragic. And I think of those moments, and I think of the role that we play um, as men, or we can play or should play, um, to support others, um, and you know, I, I know we all lead busy lives, and um, and it's difficult sometimes to make those personal connections. But at the end of the day, that's I, I truly believe what what we're called to do, what we need to do, um, and you know, I I think it's it's incredibly important um, that we think about the role that we play and picking up the phone and calling a cousin, calling a neighbor, um, checking in on folks um, because. You know, they're, they're, this, this crisis is, is real, um, and I believe that, um, you know, we, we have a, a responsibility to connect with other men in, in our families, in our communities, um, and just be there to, to listen, to support, to talk, to guide, um, and to be a, a friend at the end of the day, uh, a friend and a brother. So I, I, just, I just wanted to say that because I think it's incredibly important, um, and I hope that all of you... So on to the business of the day. Um, I uh, have the distinct honor of introducing our uh, presenter and facilitator this morning. His name is Derek Brown. He is the director of U.S. Success for the South Region of Catalyst. Uh, Derek is a dynamic, proven executive leader with over two decades of accomplished experience in corporate relations, development, community service, philanthropy, and nonprofit leadership. His unique background blends his passion for diversity, equity, and inclusion with human capital engagement and corporate partnerships. He's committed to develop mutually beneficial relationships with his partners and has a hands-on approach to create a shared vision, goals, and purpose. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Derek Brown. Good morning, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Good morning everyone, uh, gentlemen, and I think we have a few ladies in the room today, so um, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, super excited to be here with you today. Um, today we're going to talk about a, a little bit about equity, gender equity, what that looks like, uh, gender partnership, what that feels like. Uh, as Omar mentioned, mental health and mental wellness is critical, uh, not only to um, people in this room, 
uh, but to people all over the world. And our part we can play in facilitating either people getting help and or people um, being able to express themselves in safe spaces is super important. Uh, so I highly encourage you to take today what I'm going to present, what um, Eileen and Diego are going to talk about later with mental health uh, to heart. Uh, a lot of things we're going to discuss today are things you can do right now uh, and hopefully become better, both mentally prepared to be at work, but also be there for your coworkers as gender partners. So with that, I think I have the luxury. Catalyst. So we have been around for about 60 years, and all of our research um, that we do is devised to really drive home diversity and inclusion and equity in workplaces. All of our resources, our tools, our solutions are all research-based that we do ourselves in-house, and we are accelerating inclusion for everyone every day. Let's talk about men. So again, like I said earlier, what I want you to walk away today with is the ability to take something from today that you hear, that you see, uh, and be able to put it in practice. Um, the best way we can be great gender partners is by putting the things that we learn and hear into practice uh, and, being in, and being really intentful or being, being really mindful uh, and having intent behind the things that we do. So today, talking about men being engaged, as you can see on the screen, about 96% of organizations who have men engaged in DNI work, initiatives, activities, strategies, share success. They show inclusion, they show a productive, happy workforce, people feel like they belong to the workforce. As you can also see, about 30% of companies that do not have men engaged also have success. So yes, you cannot be engaged, you cannot be a gender partner in your organization, and you can still see some success and inclusion. But look at that number, three times higher when men are actively engaged in gender equity and inclusion. Why are men not engaged? Why? Anyone? Fear? Projects, yes. Anyone else? History or culture? Absolutely. So apathy, you know, um, I don't see a problem. I come to work, I do great, I get promoted, my life's great, I'm happy. We're, this gender equity thing, like, what are you talking about? Is there an issue here? Or it's not my problem. I'm not an other gender, I'm a male. So I don't have those same feelings, those same interactions uh, in the workplace that others may have because I'm male and it doesn't really involve me or impact me in any way. Another is ignorance. I don't know how to help. Oh gosh, like really? Like what does even gender equity even mean? And fear, fear of losing status, fear of making a mistake and being criticized, fear of men's disapproval or bad judgment. How do I look? What do others think about me? So today we're gonna wipe all that away and really give you some techniques and some insight into why it's important that men are gender partners in the workplace. So some of the things we talk about are ways that we can drive awareness and drive action. Operating outside of masculine norms. Um, Latino X community, very macho, traditionally, that's what society says we should be. Men in general, very masculine. You've gotta like football, you've got to want to drive fast cars, you've got to X, Y, Z, fill in the blank. We all have heard that our whole lives, right? So how do we operate outside of those norms and get past that? Having women as mentors. There are some amazing women in this world 
to do amazing things. And all of us, all genders, can learn from each other. And then a sense of fair play. So it's just the right thing to do. It should be equitable. Everyone should have a chance to advance in their career, to have an education, if they should choose so, to be more engaged in the workplace, to help drive innovation. It shouldn't matter what your gender is. And even those of us, many in this room, I'm sure, who are committed to gender equity and gender partnership, we still have barriers. We still have issues or challenges or obstacles that prevent us from showing up and leaning in into gender partnership and gender equity. 86% of men say in our, in our research, say that they are committed to ending sexism in the workplace. 86. Yes, I believe it's the right thing to do. Yes, I will stand up. Yes, I will speak out. Yes, I will lean in. However, only 31% of men interviewed felt confident enough to actually do it when they saw it happening in the workplace. Again, disparity in numbers there. So yes, I believe it's the right thing to do. Yes, I'm committed personally but I'm not sure I should or could, or I'm scared, or I have fear, or fill in the blank. And why is that? So the easiest thing we can do with all these challenges and barriers around us is to do nothing. Again, it's not impacting me personally at work, so why should I do something about that? Why should I think that inclusion is important? Or gender equity is important? Or diversity is important? One of the ways is climate of silence. This is where the workplace is such that you're afraid of what's gonna happen to you if you see say something or do something. Repercussions are gonna be negative and bad for you. Again, so why should I stand out? Why should I lean in? A combative culture. So this is a hyper-competitive culture where you need to be dominating the, the industry, you need to be striving for success, striving for status, striving for power. In that kind of environment, no place for inclusion. Definitely no place for diversity. And gender equity hasn't even come into the picture yet. Climate of futility. What difference is it going to make? I can speak up every day, all day, and the company is not going to do anything to improve gender equity or, or, in, or encourage me to be a gender partner. So why try? They're not going to do anything. And lastly, masculine anxiety. This is a stress we feel, as men, when we think that the work we're doing or the things we're doing aren't going to measure up to what society says a man should do or how a man should act or how a man should think. So all those things are some barriers that prevent men from being engaged. I'm going to take a second, and again, this is a safe space. So there's no shame, no blame, but think about it. To what extent do you identify with any of the following? I'm afraid to fear, to, I'm afraid to appear weak or indecisive. I feel pressure to like guy stuff or I won't fit in. Other people can tell I'm not one of the guys. I compare myself to other men and I feel I come up short. Will I be noticed as not being masculine enough as other men? To what extent 
if at all, would you feel anxious in the following situations? Providing emotional support to another man at work. Sharing your fears about an assignment. Seeing a woman get the promotion that I wanted. Reporting to a manager who is a woman. Being vulnerable with other men. Sit for a second. Benefits. What's in it for me? What's in it for men? There is a ton. One, and the most importantly, is being a better human being. Self-growth. Others include freedom to define who you are by your own values and not by societal norms. Freedom to be a better parent and a more of a caregiver. More rewarding relationships with your wife, spouse, partner, your children. Better physical and mental health. So that is again, mental health. Opportunity to share financial responsibility with your spouse or partner. Any other benefits to be think in the room? to being a great gender partner. Anyone? Bueller? <laughs> gender partnership defined. What is gender partnership? Gender partnership is when all genders, all genders, assume mutual accountability for advancing gender equity and inclusion. That's part one. Part two is working together to invest in and advance culture change for the benefit of everyone. That is gender partnership defined. Not so hard, is it? Not so difficult, not so difficult to understand. How do we take action? So there are actions that the company can take from the organizational side, obviously, creating the environment for gender equity and gender partnerships to thrive. And there's also a part that we take on ourselves as individuals to ensure that we are proponents of gender equity and we are being great gender partners in the workplace. So for organizations, you can see there, motivating men to get involved, being ex explicit about, living, about inviting men into the conversation, helping men realize and recognize their gender bias. We all have biases, we do, we all, we're human, we have them. It's about acknowledging them and working around them. Removing barriers to supporting men. Talking about the benefits. Promote dialogue, Again, safe spaces for conversations, difficult conversations, uncomfortable conversations. And committing to building a culture of advocacy, being advocates. On the individual side, what can we do? And I want to dive a little bit deeper into this for us individually. Get involved and believe you can make a difference. First step, raise your hand. I'm going to be involved and I can make a difference because one person can. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So being open to everyone's opinions, actively listening and reflecting in conversations. Gender and race shape all of us. And it's intersectional in so many ways, right? Intersectionality talks about identities of self, race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, 
Those are all parts of who we are. They overlap. And depending on your makeup of identity, depends on your life experiences, interaction with your people in the workplace, with people at home. We're not just one thing. Challenging assumptions that gender norms are going to hurt women. Being open about your own experiences, so speaking up, leaning in, talking about the things that you've experienced. Supporting gender equity programs and engaging others to do so as well. And trusting the process. This is scary stuff, right? This is not like it's oatmeal and ice cream. This deals with feelings, deals with societal norms, culture. So trust in the process, trust in the fact that we all know that being a great gender partner will lead to better things, will lead to better inclusion, will lead to all of us, everyone, having a better work-life experience. Recognizing your gender bias. Again, we all have it. It's there, it's human, it's normal. Engaging in cross-gender mentoring, like I mentioned earlier, having a woman as a mentor or as a boss. Seeking out awareness and building opportunities both within and outside the workplace. So gender partnership doesn't stop when you clock out, leave the office, get home. It follows you day in, day out, on the weekends, on the golf course, at dinner, at the soccer game, always there. Thirdly, building confidence to overcome barriers to change. Again, like I said earlier, behavior change is awkward. It's difficult, not easy, but it can be done. So we wanna call in and not call out mistakes when we see them, both in ourselves and in others. So don't be critical. Be supportive, both to others that you're trying to be better gender partners and to yourself. And gender equity is not a zero sum game. Gender equity is not a zero sum game. Men don't lose so women can win. Disnomer, not true. We all win when we're working together as partners. Engaging in dialogue to learn and raise awareness. Be open about your experiences and commit to gender equity. Interrupt sexism whenever you see it, at work, at home. Create safe spaces to speak. Psychological safety is super important to everyone. Being able to speak freely about how you're feeling, what you're going through, is a critical component of mental wellness and mental well-being. So having those spaces to feel comfortable and vulnerable enough to have those conversations, very important. And then publicly supporting men that are doing the work, whether that's by letting them be a role model, whether that's by calling them, at, calling them out, calling them up, Great job, I saw that. I like what you did there. I'm gonna try doing that next time I'm in that situation. And then fifthly, commit to advocate for gender partnership. Take responsibility for your own learning. Fighting gender equity is an ongoing battle. It will probably never end like other things we deal with in this world. It's constant. It takes us to be constant as well and good stewards. Practice again, I keep saying this, practice both inside and outside the workplace. You can't just be a gender partner at work and not a gender partner when you're at home. You've got to be a gender partner all the time. 
And I want to remind this, what an advocate is. Advocates are people who are committed to building positive relationships within and across groups to achieve a shared goal. Advocates are committed to building positive relationships within and across groups to achieve a shared goal. It involves humble listening. It involves learning from one another. It involves reflecting and exerting effort, being intentful. So, putting it all together, putting gender partnership into action. Here are those steps I was talking about earlier that we can take away today and do today. These are broken down into simple actions that we can do uh, to make huge impact. Some of us in the room, probably most in the room, are doing these things already. It's about doing these things and having intent behind them and then amplifying the work that you're doing. There's four components our research has shown us um, that involve putting gender partnership into action. The first is to recognize that gender impacts everyone. Again, not zero sum, not just him, her, everyone. Gender partners remain vigilant to the influence of gender on our own lives and the lives of our colleagues. Engage in internal work necessary to see that gender issues are not just related to certain groups. Again, gender is about everyone. Acknowledging the intersectional nature of gender and advancing gender equity. Again, that's that word, intersectional, intersectionality, layers of identity of who we are as people. Recognizing that gender advantages do not exist in a vacuum. How, how our gender privilege, let me say that again, how our gender privilege or lack thereof is informed by other dimensions of identity. Engaging in multi-directional action, so working, again, across groups, within groups, knowing that that drive of culture change benefits everyone. And lastly, take accountability for your own learning and your own behaviors. Listen and reflect. Continuously learn and then refine what your role is in this partnership. And it's important that we just don't assume we know what other genders may need in our gender partnership, that we're actually listening and providing them with the things that they need, depending on your partnership with that person or those people. And then lastly, constantly questioning norms, biases, and processes. Awesome. Questions. Do I see any questions in the room? We all agreed a minute ago to be great gender partners. Didn't we? Yes, we did. I saw a lot of hands raised in the room. What is anyone going to do today to take that step to be a better gender partner?
Absolutely, great question and thank you. So multi-directional actions. So not just talking to other guys, talking to women, talking to trans people, having conversations with people that are above or below where you may be in your workplace, talk about mentoring. So how am I engaging in multi multiple ways in my organization to better my understanding of what other people in the organization may need in order to also be included, feel belonged, So again, not just having a one-dimensional conversation, really opening that up, really opening yourself up to conversations that you might not normally have. You're going to lunch with a person that's in a different department, or is a different gender, or is a different sexual orientation than yourself, or a different race or ethnicity than yourself. Really diving deep, exploring what that's like, what their experiences have been like, because their lived experiences based on intersectionality are way different than mine, than yours, than his, than hers. We all have different lived experiences. We can all learn and grow from those, sharing those. Great question, thank you. Other questions? Derek. Yes, sir, hey, hello, oh, we got a mic. Yeah, we do. We have a mic. So, uh, Talmud Sampaio from Microsoft. So, first of all, thanks for this. This is great. Um, I have a, a question for you that I'll wait for the end at the end, but um, I do have a few comments and maybe even a challenge to everybody here, right? You're talking about those multi-directional actions that you can work with. Uh, and a lot of this comes from conversations, right? So, one thing that I'll say to those of you here, if you go back to your workplace and you have uh, women's groups within your company, join them. Uh, at Microsoft, we have women's rings. I actually am part of those. And I, I make sure that I meet at least two or three new colleagues uh, who are women in our group every month, right? We have a nice system for that internally that allows you to get, like, it's called icebreaker, uh, that allows you to do that. So, and that way, you kind of start talking and hearing from them. But, you know, you said it's, it's in every aspect of your life, right? Correct. So at home as well for the women that are in your life. Like, have that conversation and ask those questions of, you know, have you ever felt discriminated and why? That, that they will tell you, right? And that helps you. Um, so that, that's one thing. The other challenge I have for everyone is um, actually two, and this is more on the, on the personal side, and I'm gonna be a little vulnerable here. I am a father of two transgender women, uh, a little girl and a boy. So I have four kids. Um, and as my transgender kids were going through that transformation, I tried to learn as much as I could and put myself out there a little bit in their shoes and kind of get out of the gender norms. I, I started going and having a manicure every now and then. So I challenge you to try something like that, right? And, and it's, it's a thing that it's not a male thing or it's not a female thing. It's just something that you do for yourself. And I ended up enjoying it. And that's one of the things that I do. And I go with my girls to the salon and get our nails done. So that's, Fantastic. that's a cool thing to do. So it's a, a challenge there for you. And the other one, too, that I started doing when I have friends over, like couples that come over for dinner at the house, I try to do some of the things that are usually seen as female work, right? Mm -hmm. So I will serve the food. Right. I will clean the dishes. And I make sure that my male friends are seeing me do that, right, so that they say, hey, that's, that's okay, right? Because it is, we gotta break those norms. And we don't do that by just stalking, have to put some action in there. Question for you though, uh, that I wanted to, to uh, ask you to talk a little bit more about is, there's one sentence that you have in your talk where you talked about calling in versus calling out, mm -hmm. which is something that I learned a couple of years ago and I feel it's very, very important and easy way of engaging in difficult conversations. I don't know if everybody is aware of that means. Can you talk a little bit to that and how that you may have applied that in, uh, in discussions? Absolutely. So first of all, thank you uh, for sharing your story and being vulnerable this morning. I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, you're absolutely right. I think that um, you said a lot of their things there. One, ERGs, so employee resource groups. What better way to become a gender partner than being engaged in the women's and or the LGBTQ plus ERG groups? Having conversations that's a psychologically safe space 
to ask questions. Curiosity is very important. Honesty, even more important. So if that's a platform that most organizations already have built in. So all you gotta do is Google, look on your intranet, find out when they're meeting, go to the meeting, introduce yourself, let the leaders know why you're there. Get engaged. Second thing you said was that you do many petties. Mm -hmm. Mental health, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Those simple things we do for ourselves that allow us to take a moment to pause, reflect, think, meditate, makes me feel good, super important. And you do it with your, with your, with your children, I don't even say trans kids, your children, um, super important as well. So thank you. So calling in versus calling out. Calling in, like I said earlier, is criticizing. It is all about kind of putting someone in a very negative light when they're trying to do something that is good and they have great intent behind the work that they're trying to do. Whether they use the wrong word or the phrasing is a little bit off, their timing's a little bit off, that's calling in. Calling out. Calling out, sorry. Calling out. You're calling them out. Calling in is actually showing them support in the moment. So if you see someone calling out um, discrimination or someone not being inclusive, someone using the wrong terminology, calling someone by the wrong name or term, out of character, it's about maybe not addressing it in the moment as it's happening, but taking that person aside afterward and saying, hey, you know, I know that you meant well when you were saying these things about this, our female coworker. That probably wasn't the best way to have gone about that. And let me tell you why. I experienced this before. This happened to me a couple of years ago. It's showing that support. It's being a role model. It's modeling the behavior that you want others to do. Again, going to the ERG groups, that's modeling behavior. Doing the dishes, cooking dinner, serving your guests, that's modeling behavior. And we may not think that those things, those little bitty things, make a difference, but unless you've asked someone a question and you've been vulnerable with them and had a very um, safe space conversation, you don't know what their lived experience is. You may think you've known this person for 10 years and you know that they're, they are gender partner, they are pro everything that's positive, right? Is that really the case? How do you know? So something as simple as cleaning the dishes could have major impact on someone. Same thing when you're at work and you're leading teams or running meetings, your behavior, the way that you're being inclusive and you're, the way you run your team, modeling the behaviors you want others to do. One of the most important things managers can do to help drive inclusion within their team is one, respect, we all know that, right? But it's diversity. It's being inclusive. It's having those opportunities to have safe conversations. Being vulnerable. Letting your team know, you know what? This project is gonna take us you know, six months. It is a monster. And I'm worried we're not gonna get done on time. But together, let's put our heads together, let's work on this together. You're being vulnerable, you let them know that you're a manager, you don't have all the answers, no one does. But they get to see that side of you. They get to learn a little bit more about you as their leader, as your manager. They probably will have respect for you. Did that help answer your question, clarify? Yeah, awesome, another question? Yeah, similar to that, the calling out, calling in. Um, don't, don't you see that by now, like anyone who's still exhibiting those type of thoughts and expressing it, especially in group meetings, would already know by now. And isn't it time to be a little more aggressive with the calling out? And I only say that is because sometimes I struggle with that because I'm like, am I gonna have to fight this person even physically by interrupting it, right? And right. if it's not physical, it may just be in the corporate sense. Now I right. have an enemy that I'm gonna to have to watch my back for, or I might have to attack, right? So, 
I would like advice on how do you call out more aggressively on the spot, because by now, it's just intolerable. 20 years ago, cool. Now, no way. I could not agree with you more. Um, and you're right. Sometimes we do want to take someone and ring them around the neck. Are you crazy, you idiot? I would say two things there. One, it's the environment in which you're in. Talking about safe spaces. Everyone is not going to buy in, period. It's, it's, it's not humanly going to happen. We're not, we, will not all wait, we will not all ever be there, whether it's today, 20 years from now, 20 years ago. So it's recognizing yourself that you can only change what you have control over, which is you. In that moment, if it's appropriate to call someone out on something in a constructive and professional way, absolutely. If it's not that moment, Maybe it's after the meeting or after that incident's happened and saying to them, hey, you know what? I really I heard what you said and just come from my perspective, my experiences, that really isn't how I would talk to a woman or a person of color or fill in the blank, right? I guess the help I need is because most, most of us here are leaders, right? And so if that's happening in your meeting oh, different story. and you're the leader, I don't know if there's a space for you to take it outside of it, like something needs to be said. It would be outside. Yes, if, if, you're in a, if you're a leader and you're in a meeting and you've got an employee who is, who is behaving like a jerkle and not being appropriate, not being respectful, probably the meeting is not the way in which you as a manager need to address that. That is a one-off conversation as soon as that meeting is over. Okay. All right. Immediately address the behavior. And again, you're talking about why it's not appropriate, our company policy, our procedures, our corporate culture. There's a million reasons why that wouldn't be appropriate. And challenge them to task. What are some ways in which you, as their manager, can role model, provide access to training, provide access to opportunities to, to learn? But absolutely, if you're a manager, you've got an employee who is not there yet, um, especially if you're in this room, that's a conversation that needs to be had sooner than later. And again, coming from a place of respect, of being constructive, and having solutions to help them move on past whatever issues they're dealing with. Thank you very much, thank you. Okay, got it, I'm being wrangled now. I think I'm running around, oh my God. Sorry about that. Um, so thank you guys so much. Thank you very much for having me today. I really do appreciate it. Great conversation, as you can see, it's gonna gone on probably all day long. Um, there are several elements to this. I would I highly encourage you to dive in, catalyst.org. Um, I've got cards, reach out, please. Uh, I'd love to have more conversations with you and to dive deeper. I wanna now bring up um, amazing people from HPE, uh, Elaine and Diego, to talk more about mental health. Thank you. Throughout my whole life, I knew that I dealt with emotions and experiences that were difficult to explain to others and understand even for me, because they did not fit within the canons of what a man should do or how we should act or how we should feel. I constantly felt sad and without energy to carry out actions that seemed like nothing to the rest. Anxiety, shame, and this feeling of pressure in my chest became part of my daily life for as long as I can remember. It wasn't until it became a worrying situation even for my parents that um, I started receiving medical and psychological attention. And it obviously helped me to understand where these feelings and where these emotions were coming from. But I also understood that having received therapy before would have radically changed the way I addressed it and how I felt at the moment. Thank you for sharing your story, Diego. This is so brave of you. It's actually one of the first steps that we can take to start breaking the stigmas around mental health. And May is actually the month of awareness of mental health, so it's the perfect timing to talk about it. Today, we are going to address this very important topic that has a lot of impact 
in the way we live and face every aspect of our lives. Specifically, how is affecting Hispanic men and some steps that we can all take to start breaking these stigmas. So the tech world is built on the backs of incredibly bright minds. Um, this room, it's a proof of it. Uh, this world demands innovation and there's always the need of transforming an idea or a project into scalable business. It comes with high stress. It comes with late nights or abnormal working hours. We are always having to deliver demanding work with tight, in tight deadlines and there's always this pressure to excel and climb the corporate ladder. We are all part of this crunch culture. Open sourcing nonprofit launches every year a survey on mental health, specifically in the tech industry. And the latest result, results sorry, show that one out of two tech industry workers in the US have been diagnosed with mental health condition. 75% of the tech industry workers are men. 40% of these tech workers avoid seeking help and struggle in silence because of the fear of judgment from colleagues, from family, and from their community. 80% of these tech workers said that their productivity is actually being affected by a mental health issue. And the top conditions are anxiety, depression, ADHD, and stress response syndromes, like lack of sleep, anxiety, burnout. Sounds familiar? Thank you, Eileen, for sharing that information. But let's see also what happens when we cross this data with the Hispanic mental health statistics as well. Well, according to the US Census Bureau, one out of five Americans declared uh, having Hispanic heritage, which means that around 20% of the US population has Hispanic heritage. Now that we have sized the amount of people that we're referring to in this conversation, let's see other, other information like, for example, 22% of Hispanic Americans declared having a mental illness according to the 2021 National Survey on Drugs and Health. Well, only 36% of them received any kind of treatment in comparison to the 52% for non-Hispanic whites. On the other hand, according to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, 56.8% of Hispanic young adults from 18 to 25 years with a serious mental illness in 2018 did not receive any kind of medical or psychological treatment. This led us to the shocking statistic of the US Department of Health on Human Services of Minority Health which states that suicide rates for Hispanic men is four times the, uh, the rate for Hispanic women. But how does this all look into money and productivity? Well, according to Kelly McCain and Philip Campbell, um, the mental health conditions are projected to contribute to a $16 trillion loss in productivity by 2030. So as we can all see, mental health is one of the biggest challenges that we have as tech industry. Isn't that concerning? It is. And actually, something that adds up to these numbers are all the myths out there around mental health that we seem to keep feeding instead of stopping and questioning them. So why don't we start by dismitifying some of the misconceptions around mental health? I will need all of your help. So if you have ever heard one of these statements, or you can relate, please raise your hand. Therapy is not for Hispanic people. Eso es para loquitos. <laughs> well, actually, therapy is a very valuable tool, regardless of the cultural background. It's actually a space where you can find confidentiality, you can talk about whatever you're dealing with, and I'm sure all here will love this you can set goals, specific goals for improvement on your mental well-being. Mental health issues are created or exaggerated for attention. Ay, no le hagas caso, solo quiere llamar la atención, que se ponga a limpiar su cuarto. 
So by assuming this, we unintentionally create an unsafe, unsafe environment. And we close the door to the, our loved ones, to our friends, to our colleagues that might be needing, seeking guidance or help to tackle whatever they're dealing with. Let's try out this one. Mental health, health problems are a sign of weakness. Llorar es de débiles. Los hombres no lloran. Have you heard this before? Well, actually, mental health disorders are illness, illnesses, and these are not signs of poor character or lack of willpower. If anything, tackling a mental health issue takes a lot of strength. Have you heard people with mental illness should be isolated for the community? Ay no, qué miedo que los manden al manicomio. Most people with a mental illness recover quickly and they might not need hospital care. Actually, one out of a thousand might need it. Okay, seeking mental health support is a betrayal of family privacy. ¿Qué va a decir la familia? Ay no, qué oso, qué van a decir los compadres? ¿Qué van a decir los tíos? Seeking mental health support is a responsible and courageous step towards wellness that ultimately not only benefit the individual that is facing or dealing with any mental health issue, it also benefits the people around us. But let's hear some stories. So now that we understood that getting rid of those detrimental myths around mental health is crucial, we also wanted to address um, some statements of celebrities, uh, Hispanic celebrities that have opened it up about their mental health because we do believe that being able to relate our own personal stories, it's very important uh, and it plays a gigantic role in feeling confident and ready to speak up. Let's start with J Balvin, the Colombian singer, whose documentary, The Boy from Medellin, uh, addressed and talks about the loneliness and the mental issues that uh, he went through being a, pub a public figure. And he believed that by talking about this in his documentary, he will reach his youngest audience and it will encourage them in speaking and addressing their own mental issues, uh, issues and seeking for help as well. Uh, we also have Cristian Nodal, who is a Mexican songwriter and singer, who also recently said that after having a very, very bad time, um, a hard time for a while, therapy was the key element on his recovery. And this is part of what we wanted to share today with you that I think that we all know that there's no shame in seeking for medical help, uh, in, in medical attention, sorry. But it is exactly the same when it comes to psychological attention. There is no shame in that. And actually, we all need psychological attention at some, some uh, points of our lives. So there's no shame in it. Uh, the last example that I have is someone that I believe that we all know. Lionel Messi also addressed mental health and he opened it up about the hard time that he had back in 2010 when he was going through some uh, problems with treasury. And all of the media pressure and the hate comments that he received on a daily basis on social media obviously affected his mental health. I want you to picture this. Just imagine being a kid and watching your biggest idol on national TV addressing mental health and seeking for help. It is a great start in breaking stigma. Okay, so let's start by understanding the stigma. Hispanic culture often emphasizes the importance of family, community, and religion. And this tends to influence the way we act towards mental health. Seeking help for physical problems is well accepted. Mental health is not. Mental health actually, mental health issues actually create emotional distress, which manifests as physical symptoms. And it's easier to take a chill pill. You know, let's battle fatigue, let's battle this headache, instead of thinking what's the real root cause? Why am I feeling a mental burnout? Why am I feeling anxiety? And if you think of the influence of traditional, traditional gender roles in Hispanic community, this dynamic becomes harder for men 
because there's often an expectation or the perception that men need to portray vitality, strength. And in many of, many of the cases, men are the, the main providers. So no pressure, right guys? So there's always a big desire to maintain a strong image within this community, which can contribute to the stigma. So what's the impact of the stigma? Well, now that we understand what a stigma is, uh, let's also understand that the stigma leads to underdiagnosis. And underdiagnosis leads to the underutilization of medical and health services that we have as, as a Hispanic community. If you don't want to be seen as someone weak, then you will not seek for help or you will not talk about it. And this can only exacerbate the severity of mental health conditions. If you never speak about what you're going through, then the most probable is that you will never understand where these feelings are coming from. And if you are unable to understand that, then you'll be unable to feel empathy. But not only empathy for yourself, but also empathy for others that might be around you and going through the same things. So if we don't challenge the old ideas of what it means to be a man, people might stop wanting to deal with this, with mental health problems. We need to start somewhere, all men. We need to break down the stigma step by step. Our goal today here is for you to leave this room at least one step closer in breaking stigma. First, we need to educate. Educate ourselves how, through some re research, YouTube videos, podcasts, maybe talking with an expert, talking with someone that might be experiencing the same as you are. But also it is important to talk about it with your loved ones, with your family, with your friends, with your community, because the first step in breaking stigma is to learn about it and start talking about it and breaking these taboos that we all have as a society, specifically when, we, when it comes to Hispanic society. And also understanding that Hispanic culture is crucial for fighting mental health and stigma effectively. Adjusting interventions to fit cultural norms improve their impact. We also need to promote an open dialogue. And you have heard that this is a great way in other sessions to start talking about things and creating safe spaces, creating psychological safety. This is a really important step. Remember that it's okay not being okay. And please, 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 let's eliminate language that can be stigmatizing, such as terms crazy, insane, or psychotic. These are not even used by doctors anymore. And you, you how, how do you break stigma? <laughs> There's a comment or question? I got you. Oh, sure. <laughs> I'm the timekeeper. <laughs> I just wanted to address something more, more piggyback, right? Um, spent 20 years in the military, I've seen a lot of different things, right? Mental health is really real, right? We have, you know, I, I think uh, uh, th there was an actual uh, okay. report that was done, like 40 military, you know, people commit suicide based off of PTSD and the things that they've seen, right, throughout their 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 careers, right? So, uh, mental health is, mental health is real, right? I just want to testify. Um, I typically go to the different VAs. I, I speak to, you know, the uh, the uh, different folks with PTSD, and, and in a way, it helps me. Right, it, 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 that's my therapy when I can speak to different people. Right, so you know, it's not only in tech; it's family members that you know that have served in the military that have a community. Right, so have the conversation. Right, check in with them, make sure that they're okay. Right, um, just wanted to get that out there and thank, thank you guys you. for really putting this on. I, I really do appreciate that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for sharing your experience. <laughs> First of all, thank you for, for this session. I think that was absolutely necessary. There's a big stigma around mental health. But I would like to go a little bit beyond that because you didn't even mention once the medication. And I think it's fundamental because uh, depending on what is your problem, I mean, you can have just a conversation with a person that can help you. But sometimes, mostly if you are suicidal, you really will need the specific medication and you will need to... And, to, to be treated as if you have a broken leg. It's not about trying to feel better. You really need to 
to, I mean, to put the cast in the, in the leg. The same happens. I mean, when you have a very, very big, I mean, problem in, in the chemistry of your brain, you really need to have some medication to make it better. And you cannot even just try and solve that. So um, I, I wanted to bring that, that that was not mentioned, and I think that there is a massive stigma on that. And it's like, I mean, you have a heart problem, you will have something. If you have a leg problem, you will have you something. Have you have a cancer, you will have something. You have, um, I mean, a mental problem, you will need also some medication. It's very, very important that we all understand that it's, I mean, it's another disease. It's, it's, it's an, I mean, not different to have a call and you, and, and you have a treatment. So I think it's important to bring this, to explain this, and uh, you need to have, um, I mean, any kind of medication because of uh, you are feeling suicidal. It's something that will happen for some time and then you will be back to you and you will be able to be uh, supporting society and doing things. So. Yeah, that's right. Actually, um, I've took pills uh, to feel better for the majority of my life, and I know and I understand uh, what it is, and I understand also that I, there's a big stigma behind that. So yeah, that's an important thing to say. I remember the first time that I went to the psychiatrist, and he told me that there are some things that it's all about brain chemistry. Even with therapy, which is necessary, and, and you need to go through therapy as well, there are things that will not get solved just by talking about it. You need to take pills sometimes because your brain just don't produce something or produce less or something. So, yeah, that's something important to shout out to. Thank you. Thank you. We have no more time, but thank you thank all. Thank you. For your